Um, anyway, I'm Linda, and I don't have a lot of credentials after my name, like MD or PhD, but what I do have is OCD. And um, it's ironic that this condition, obsessive compulsive disorder, leads me to want to actually find order. It makes me want to organize, categorize, and discover things in my surroundings. So this, to me, is kind of a, a personal nightmare. If I go into a store that looks like this, I get no shopping done. What I have to do is organize the rack by all the sizes first, and then the colors and the patterns. And then maybe I get some shopping done. Um, Thank God somebody invented online shopping. Um, and then I have other quirks, like I've been known to refold all the sheets in my friend's linen closet when I stay with her. Friend, you know who I'm talking about. Um, but I won't bore you with all of the, the personality quirks that I have. Suffice it to say, I'm very lucky that OCD isn't nearly as debilitating for me as I know it can be for others. But after living with it for 54 years, I've come to realize how it has influenced my decisions and really mapped my territory. So I think the, the symptoms of this, or whatever you call them, started emerging when I was in middle and high school. And I gravitated to subjects like math and chemistry. I love the symmetry of the equations and the chemical reactions. And having a right answer on a test was really important. But it was when I got to college and I took my first genetics course that I found my true calling. This was my territory, DNA. The thought that this elegant scaffold underlies all the messy biology was just so appealing from an organizational standpoint for me. <laughs> the fact that A's line up with T's and G's with C's, and then they come together to form these codons that code for amino acids that turn into protein chains was truly magical. The power that's encoded into DNA is awe-inspiring but it can also be very startling when you think that a single point change in this three billion letter molecule can result in a condition like cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs or sickle cell anemia. So at this point, I thought I was gonna go into medicine and when I learned about how ge genetics can impact health, that sealed the deal. I pictured myself becoming a, a genetic anthropologist or someone in that field and helping patients navigate their health through their genomes. Now, this was all going down in the late 70s. Yes, I'm old. Um, great music. Any ABBA fans out there? Um, and it was just a few decades after Franklin and Crick and Watson and Wilkins. I put the emphasis on her for women's sakes. Um, but they had, they had just elucidated the structure of DNA. That ushered in a whole new era of molecular biology research. And scientists very quickly were in this land grab to find the genes for a growing list of human diseases. And the single gene disorders were really the low-hanging fruit because the genetics are very clear. And they were focused on families and founder populations where you could map the disease across multiple generations, sort of like you see, oops, sorry, wrong direction, not in that. <laughs> like you see in a family pedigree, where you just see the markings of the colors associated with people who have a disease and who don't. So the way I think about this is it's, this was really re research 1.0, because it didn't require much involvement on the part of the patient. You really only needed to know whether or not they had the disease and where they were in that family structure. Get some DNA from them and you're off to the races. So it was very straightforward. But this was just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding the genetics of human disease. What you really needed to know now are, what are what's underlying the things that are more common, like heart disease and hypertension and cancer and diabetes that affect way more people. These studies cannot do be done looking at a family pedigree. Instead, what you really need are at least 1,000 patients, if not tens of thousands of patients, and you need well-matched controls to do a traditional case control study design. And you also need to read the DNA in greater detail. So the good news is, is that the development of technologies in DNA sequ sequencing were going into hyperdrive. And for whatever reason, that's where my career went, and that's the path I took. Because while I was in college, I met with several doctors and just wanted to interview them about, about their professions. And when I posed rather naively the question of how they were using genetics in the care of their patients, they just kind of shrugged and gave me blank stares in return. So at that point, I knew this probably was not the right career path for me to go into medicine. And so I spent a few years working in a research laboratory. And while I enjoyed the work, I noticed that the professor 
I was working for spent most of his time holed up in his office, sitting at his computer, writing and submitting grants to try to keep the lab going. And I had to say that wasn't all that appealing either. Luckily, I landed in San Francisco, and this was the mid-'80s, right when the biotech industry was really starting to boom. And we had amazing companies like Genentech, who were, building these, were developing these big molecule drugs. And right alongside them were these very interesting tool companies that helped enable that. One of these companies that I went to work for was Applied Biosystems, or ABI as it was known. Back in their heyday, they were the gorilla in the DNA sequencing market. Um, their, their platform was at the center of the Human Genome Project, both the public and the private efforts, which was quite a coup for them. That project took about $3 billion in funding and took over a decade. But finally, in the year 2000, then-President Bill Clinton announced from the White House, with all the scientists standing around him, that the first rough draft, and uh, emphasis on the rough, had been finally sequenced of the human genome. And so that was a very momentous occasion in this field. Um, but just three years later, I ended up going to work for a company called Perligen Sciences. And at Perligen, they had raised $100 million and resequenced 50 genomes in 15 months. It was amazing, putting Moore's law to shame. The data from that sequencing, or that resequencing as it was called, became the basis for a map of human variation. Now we had the tools to go in and start studying the more common conditions, and all we needed were the DNA samples. Ha, huh, easier said than done. So my job at Perligen was to go out and pound the pavement and try to find these collaborations that we could do that would apply our technology. And I was sort of coming up dry. And so our CEO decided to run an ad in the journal Science, and it said, Got DNA? And it was really mostly an appeal to the pharmaceutical industry to say, if you've got DNA samples from patients who were on a drug and you had good responders and bad responders, we really wanted to do those types of studies called pharmacogenetics. So at the end of the ad was a, an email address that directed to me and my phone number. And I thought my phone would be ringing off the hook, and I was really excited. Not so much. Luckily, we did get one email from a neurologist at Mayo Clinic who wrote to say that he had DNA samples from over 400 Parkinson's patients and their healthy siblings. Probably wasn't the greatest study design, and the numbers were too low, but it was the best we got. So we decided to go for it. We got $2 million in funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and this study became one of the world's first genome-wide association studies. When I look back at this ad and the study that resulted from it, I realized what an influence that's had on my career and my life because it was how I met Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. So Sergey's been very public about how Parkinson's has impacted his family. And so it's where our, our paths first crossed. He showed up at a meeting where we were discussing this project, and he was asking all the right questions. So back to this problem, though, of recruiting people into studies. I, you know, you can only run so many ads in science, but there had to be a better way. And so I started thinking about the idea of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding this research, where you could go to the web, recruit willing participants, and use the internet to gather additional information from them. It would get rid of the cost problem because it would be distributed over many individuals, sort of like we see now with Indiegogo and Kickstarter and some of these other crowdfunding platforms. And then, also on top of that, why not be able to give the data back to the participants, especially if they're paying for it? It is their data, after all. So these were the, the ideas that started to come together, and they were just crazy enough to interest the guys at Google. And, as it turns out, one of the girlfriends <laughs> of the Google guys. This was the beginning of the company 23andMe that I co-founded in 2006. It's really simple. You just sign up online. The kit comes to you in the mail, you spit in it, send it back, and within a few weeks, you're navigating your genome, learning about how your health is impacted and how it is reflected in your ancestry. You might even find a few new cousins. Today, there are upwards of 800,000 people who are participants in 23andMe. And luckily, the vast majority of those people have also opted into the research mission, which we dubbed 23andWe. Under the leadership of my co-founder, Ann Wojcicki, it has become the world's largest genetic database. So where are we now? We're in NGS, 
Does anybody have any idea what NGS stands for? It's next generation sequencing. This is mind blowing. So remember, it cost $3 billion and took over a decade to do the first genome. Now we can do it for, let's say, probably less than $3,000, and it takes a couple of days. It really puts Moore's Law to shame. So this is no longer any kind of a bottleneck in research. So what are the next challenges? So I would turn this question around to you, the audience, to ask you, are you perfectly 100% healthy? Do you get the right amount of REM versus deep sleep every night? Are you at your perfect weight? Do you know what foods you should be eating for your body type, for your metabolism? Should you be paleo or vegan or what, what have you? There's so many different diets out there. And what about this whole gluten-free problem? Where did that come from? And then we've got these steep rises in autism and other conditions that we don't really have the answers for. So it turns out people have a lot of questions. And unfortunately, I don't think the answers are going to come anytime soon from the traditional research establishment or from our, our doctors. We're going to really have to be the ones that find the answers to these questions. The good news is, though, that we now have this thing called the Internet of Things, where we have all of these connections and we have all these devices and gadgets that are going to start to generate amazing data around us. So in addition to being able to sequence your genome, you can sequence your microbiome, which is all the critters that live in you and on you. You can look at the double breaks in your DNA with exogen. You can also, um, in the future, wear a patch that does 24-7 readings of things that you normally would have to get a blood test for. And of course, the wearable market has gone kind of crazy. Microsoft just announced their own health band. These things, of course, measure your steps and your calories and even your sun exposure. And so they're getting very sophisticated on the data you're generating on these things you're wearing. And then certainly around you, we're even to a point now where our bathroom scales can tell us our CO2 levels. How do those map to things like headaches and how tired you're feeling and so forth? The problem is right now that where do all the data go? It sort of looks like this to me. But it's an opportunity to organize, categorize, and discover amazing things from our data. And I guess you could call this now this era of research 3.0, because now what we're doing is we're pushing it out to you. You get to pose the questions. You get to determine the data that you want to gather that might shed light on your question. And then you can share it if you want to, if you want to go out and, and talk about what, what you experienced and what you learned from that and find other people who share that with you. It's time for health research to go viral. It hasn't yet, but I think the time is right now. So this is what has really um, inspired the creation of this new company, Curious. We're not launched yet, but this is the idea to put people at the controls. You get to manage your data, how it's collected, how it's shared, and then what we can learn from that. Finally, I had the great pleasure of experiencing this in a vineyard in Sonoma County a few years ago. I don't know if you've ever seen this live, but to see these starlings flying around in the sky, almost like big schools of fish, I hope you all can see it sometime. But what this has become is a metaphor for me for all of the, the data that we're going to be swimming in, all of us. We already are, we just aren't quite aware of it yet. But if we're able to capture these patterns and these fleeting moments when we see something happening that could be of, of great use to all of us, just not even for ourselves, but for our whole community, won't that be an interesting time? I definitely think it's a territory worth mapping. Thank you.